Thanks. Uh, this is this is a tough uh, sell for us because I, I just work for uh, uh, work with Germans. I work with a postmodern group, and and to come into the elite, what I consider the elite, you guys are the cream of the crop. You absolutely scare me to death. I'm looking for an air sickness bag as we as uh, as, uh, as I get started with uh, with this. Um, here's what what I would like to uh, to do it at the outset of this. It's something we addressed our Germans just a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to speak to you just as if you were German. Here, here's the thing that we know about German, and say it, I've traveled in about 30 countries so far. Everybody says the same thing about, uh, about Germany, and I'm going to make an application to us here in just a second. But in Germany, if you ever think of Germany, here's, here's what we always think of, quality. Made in Germany means something. It, it means something that we, we, we excel at what we do. We have so many engineers. Everything that we do is just, uh, it's just planned out. It's meticulous. Uh, we're a perfectionist society. The other thing that we think of when we think of Germans is we think that uh, Germans uh, are um, a very industrious people. They are hard, hard workers. They make something out of nothing. But if you think of Germans worldwide, it always comes out to the same thing when we reduce it to say, okay, what do you think about Germans? Not only the good qualities, what would you say would be the one trait that sticks out in your mind about a German? And this is what always comes across. Germans are Stubborn, just absolutely stubborn. When they have a mindset, we call it tradition, we call it culture, we call it parameters, whatever you want to do. There's something that's a binding, it's like a straitjacket. Now here's my question that we're going to have for you today. When we look to a German Christian and we're asking them, where do you stand in Christ? What, what is your position and how are you following him? Are you following hard after him? Here's the question, are you being steadfast? Are you just being German? Are, are, you, are you, being, you being somebody that really is convinced of Jesus Christ and your heart is dedicated to him? Or are you just being stubborn? Which one is it? Outwardly, it may look the same. So there's two kinds of people that I would like to address today and kind of like to, to basically speak into your heart. And I think that we're all going to be in, in one of these two groups. There are some of us that right now are kind of going through a difficult time. We've got some highs, we've got some lows, and sometimes the lows kind of get tedious and they get kind of long, and we end up being in a certain section where we say, where am I right now? It's very difficult sometimes to see that in the mirror, but we, Jesus told us that we're very good at seeing this in others. That's why we, we can spot the splinter in somebody else's eye, even while we're ignoring you know, the beam in our own eye. So, so let's do this. I think... I think we see this in our friends, and so maybe we can extrapolate that out at some point and say, okay, that's, there's a big probability or possibility anyway that I'm in one of these groups. So let me ask you just at upraise of hands, does anybody know or have ever met a bridezilla? Do you know a bridezilla? <laughs> you know what a bridezilla is? This is that chick that, that yeah, this guy. He's, uh, the bridezilla is the chick, she hears that the mint green tablecloths are not available and freaks out just panic because everything is ruined everything i've dreamed about for the first 18 19 20 24 25 years of my life is now ruined because the tablecloths are not the right color bridezilla there might be somebody here um, how many of you know that uh, maybe somebody that right now is fighting uh, homesickness somebody's just kind of like missing mom you know, I, th I used to think my mom was mean until I got into the real world. You met a couple of professors here. <laughs> Mama, let me come back home. Yeah. So we, we have thoughts. We say, man, I, I really want to do something. I want to go out in the world. I, I want to impact culture. I want to leave this world a better place than the way I found it. But right now, we're just kind of struggling at certain thought patterns in our life. And we have a hard time staying focused because, because the cafeteria doesn't cook like mom. And, and, and that's, for some of you, that's a good thing, but for the most of us, it's, okay. So, so some of us have, have thought patterns, and, and, it, and, and unless we get that under control, unless we stay on focus and stay on target, we're, we're in deep, deep trouble. Some of you have friends where you notice that there is certain financial patterns, certain things in your life, you can notice in them, and, and they've gotten a grant, or they get an allowance, They've gotten tuition money that's been sent as cash. Grandma's given them some funds, made things available. And instead of applying it in the proper way to what it was assigned to do, all of a sudden it's like, party! 
And so now we just, it's just kind of like a spending spree and the, and the credit cards, look, there's still balance left on it. That means I can just, you know, just go out and spend it anywhere. And, and you say, is, is that healthy? Is that good for you right now? Well, I'm dealing with this in my life and that just kind of helps ease the pressure. Those are thought patterns that can get us into serious trouble. Now, for those of you that are very, very disciplined, those of you that have the thought pattern in life, you've got that all under control. There is a second side that comes and you don't expect it. Because life does not always work out as we're planning. It just comes at us in a rush. It's like sometimes the fire hydrant kind of thing. It's just there. Life doesn't always turn out the way that you planned it. If you do not believe me, take a look. Do you think I planned this? Seriously. Do you think that I sat down and said, you know, with a yellow legal pad, boy, at 30 years old, I want to be bald. That's just my greatest goal in life. And, and the rest of what I got, maybe if it would turn white by the time I'm 40 years old, wow, that would just be so, that'd be so fabulous. Life, doesn't, life just brings you change that you weren't expecting. And by the way, student, get a good look. This is your future. <laughs> Here's what's going to happen. Life just comes rushing at you, and there's going to be change that you weren't planning on. And the question is, what do you do then? Is it time to hit the panic button? Exactly. Exactly. Time to hit the panic button. Just got, just got news a little while back in my family. It's kind of a humorous thought that uh, there's only one person in our family that has, had a, uh, has been to a uh, uh, plastic surgeon in our family, and that's my father. Uh, because here's a genetic trait that we have in ours. We have, we have uh, extra eyelid stuff that hangs down like, kind of like a turkey thing. And, um, <laughs> And so that when you smile, then we get these little slit eyes anyway, but then there's all this stuff, and so you can't see anymore. And, and so it's hanging down, down like this, and so when I look at him, then I know, that that's my future. I know that's, that's coming down the turnpike at me. Here's what I want to drive at. You've got a plan, you've got certain thoughts, you know that this is your direction, this is your worldview, these are the priorities that you've got, these are the thoughts that you hold to and you cleave to, and some, in some ways you call them convictions. My question is, my question is this, are you steadfast in those, or are you just stubborn? I'm going to tell you, if you don't have the right one, there are dire, dire consequences. Because here's what it is. We're going to look at a verse of scripture today that says this. You might have the right theology. You might have all the checklist on Jesus. You got it right. You've hung around the halls of this campus long enough that it's soaked into you. You know all the right answers on the catechism. In your mind, you have the ability to be able to explain to someone who Jesus is and what he's done for us on the cross. And Paul's going to explain to us in just, a, in just a couple of seconds. At the exact same time, while you are a great theologian, at the same time, you are a practicing atheist. Now, not in your heart. But what he says is this. Our thoughts are crucial to whether or not what we say we are matches up with our identity in Christ. So I want to invite you to Ephesians chapter 4 for just a few seconds, a few minutes, and we'll get to work in verse 17. Here's a man who goes to a city in Ephesus, a port city in what is now Turkey. A port city had lots and lots of people that came through it. That means they were very, very wealthy. They had a lot of uh, Hellenistic input, they had a lot of a Roman input. This was a, was, a, was a connected city. It was a very global city. Any city today that has a major airport is a global city. Mass communication, global city. We have lots of input. You get it from all different kinds of sources. And at the same time, in this city, they were very religious. 
Within the city, they had temples to this goddess Diana, Artemis, and, and there they had temple priestesses that were nothing more than prostitutes because if we can experience something and it's just very ecstatic and we, we can just kind of go to a new, new level emotionally, that will then bring you along on your spiritual journey. Now, for some of you, that's foreign because you say, we don't have temples like that. Yes, we do. We build temples that seat 70,000 people and 22 priests get out on the field and knock each other's block off every week while the priestesses stand down and we call them cheerleaders. That's where we worship. We have the exact same thing. We are a global society. And within this global society, this is where we're going to find that Paul then has some words for us. Here's what he says. This I say, therefore, to those of you that are believers in Jesus Christ, those of you that are in a society like this, he says, and testify in the Lord, this is straight from Jesus' lips, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Now, before I go further, here's what he says. We are counter culture. We are counter culture. We are not anti culture. We are counter culture. You say, what's the difference? Our goal is not to show our anger, our goal is to reflect his glory. There is a major, major difference. We are not here to say we are upset with how the election turned out. We're not here to say we just think that everything's going to hell in a handbasket. We are here to say we have other priorities and we have other distinctives and we are reflecting not just my idea, I'm reflecting his person. I want to show Jesus Christ. So he says, make sure, make sure that when you come after Jesus Christ, your walk shows that. Then he goes on further and says this. Here is a description of somebody that is a Gentile. In German, it's translated over as a heathen. This is not just a non-Jew person. This is a person who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he's trying to say. An atheist or somebody without God, for you Greek scholars, ateos. In the vanity of their mind, here's the description, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. If it was automatic that when you became a follower of Jesus Christ that your thought life came under control, he would not write these verses. It is possible to be a follower of Jesus Christ and yet, and yet he says, with everything that is in my being, as passionate as I can be, make sure that you do not have right theology and at the same time, look like you're an atheist. Do not look like you're one that does not have God in your life. And that is possible, is what he's saying. So where does it start? The vanity of your mind. Here's what he says. Your thought life is where your relationship with Jesus Christ begins. It does not begin with experience and then move towards your thought. Thought always precedes your experience with Jesus Christ. Be careful of the hardness of your heart. Where is your thought life right now? Let me, as blunt as I can with, with our German people, a dysfunctional society who has never heard from their own parents, I love you. Where that the number one, the number one problem that we have in our society after hundreds and hundreds of street interviews, six to one, way above anything else, not finances, not criminality, not stress, not job, not employment, none of that. Six to one, our people say in Germany, our number one problem is loneliness and reconciliation after fights. Let me tell you this as I tell them. Some of you here are fighting right now if you do not change your thought life you will i promise you this will end up with the exact same marriage as your parents
For some of you, that is good news. But I fear that some of you have never had any other pattern the dysfunction and fighting and two people cohabitating, but where love and Christ is not exalted. And if you do not change your thought life, your pattern will be exactly that, and your marriage will duplicate exactly that, because this is what Paul says. You can be on board with Jesus, but we've got to get the thought life down. We have to have that relationally to be able to connect not only with him, but this extrapolates out on our level. The thought pattern guides everything that we do when we are interconnecting with one another. For some of you, for me, when stress builds, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't, you know, that's not, that's not an issue for me. But I've come to find out at my age, stress builds, I love calories. Food loves me, and I love food. That is a thought issue. And until I wrestle with that and say, the thought pattern, the worldview, the perspective, the priorities that I place on that will guide me down to an, where it's a vain understanding, he says. This is not conceitedness. It's not like, you're so vain you think the song is about you. What he's saying is, that, that, it, that thought pattern you think is going to lead to the rainbow and the pot of gold at the end of it. But here's what it is. It's vain. It goes in a circle and it never gets you there. Corinthians says it this way. If we, don't, if we don't have a resurrected Jesus, you wish and desire for forgiveness of sin, but here's what he says. Your faith is in vain. You're going that direction, but if Jesus is not resurrected from the dead, it's just all empty thought. It's, it's nothing. It's leading nowhere. Thoughts that we say are important and that matter, but never ever lead us to what we want to have or where we want to finally arrive. So here's the goal. The pattern that we see in this verse works this way. What I think guides what I do. And what I do determines the love that I receive. Now that's so important. Let me repeat it. The thoughts that I have guide what I do. And the things that I do determine or produce the love that I receive. And I know possibly at some point, some, some theologian is going to say, okay, Gandhi, <laughs> hold on. Are you preaching works salvation? No, no, no. Not in the least. That is a free gift that we can claim that has been given to us freely. I am speaking to you on 1 John where it says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then what? We, we, we have fellowship. We have fellowship. We receive his love. It's always offered, but we receive it. We're in a position to be able to understand it when we bring our thoughts in alignment. Are you willing, as you sit, as a student, as a pastor, as a faculty, as staff at this school, are you willing right now to bring thoughts into obedience with his lead? Now, this is a tough one for me, I'll, I'll, just to be honest. I'm going to share out of uh, the um, uh, brokenness of, 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 of my life. Back when I was uh, 16, 17 years old, I was a junior uh, 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 bull rider in the uh, Arizona rodeo circuit. I had already determined I'm checking out of the Jesus thing. It's not working for me. Uh, bitterness, hormones, whatever you want to call it, was building in the rebellion of a young, young teenager. So that when within our own family, the ramifications were huge, were huge. But I began to see parents that were guided for this, and somehow in my mind, I had twisted those to think, okay, the reason that our family can't get along is because mom and dad have no clue. In my mind, I had already determined my parents were somewhat, for lack of a better word, they were idiots. 
I can remember very distinctly, 17 years of age, the only time that it came to that, my father two or three inches bigger than I am, we stood nose to nose, as embarrassed as I am to say this, stood nose to nose and both of us had clenched fists. I do not even know what the discussion was about. All I can remember is this quote from my father. As we stood there with white knuckles staring each other eye to eye and he said this, if you think you're big enough, go ahead and try and get a swing in. That was the level of our family. I was in a desperate, desperate position. There was something in me that said, this is not right. I seek harmony and I want that. Through circumstances that a work colleague was abducted West Phoenix and taken to the outskirts of Phoenix and abused and murdered, my life came to a screeching halt. And I began to wonder, is there really an eternity? Is there really somewhere where Sandy will spend her eternal destiny? And are you real, Jesus, yes or no? Either I have to determine yes 100% and follow you with my whole heart, or I have to get off the fence and say no. It's not worthy, there is no eternity, and let's just skip it. And in the brokenness of a young teenager's heart, I can remember specifically saying, God, this is not fair. I, I, I have no right to do this. But if you are real, would you not only reveal yourself, but would you somehow bring unity back in our family? Would you possibly maybe, maybe bring us back together? Would there be a possibility that we can reconcile? Could we be friends in our own household? I have no right to claim that for you, and I'm not lying out, laying out a fleece, but if you really are real, I'm asking you and begging you from the bottom of my heart, would you reveal the issue, reveal the problem? And I prayed, and I prayed. Days went by. About 10 days after I prayed that prayer, I got alone with God and said, God, I, are you gonna reveal it? And he said, yes. Good. Finally, that I can have some relief in my heart. So who is it? Is it dad? Is it, is it mom? Is it my siblings? It, are they the ones that are the problem? And God said, I'm going to tell you who it is. It's you. And you are certainly not guilty for everything that's gone on in this household, but you are responsible for your heart. And you are the one that brings it to the head. And you are the one that has brought this family to a volcano. Because you seem to think that you have the right to claim what is right and what is fair. And you are going to determine until you get it, you are going to throw a tantrum and be angry. You have brought the poison into this household. And it broke my heart. And over the course of the next couple of days, I would first go to my father and say, I am sorry. To my mom, and ask for forgiveness. And to all of my siblings, if your thought line is ever to come in to order and to alignment with Jesus Christ, the first step is only this. You must be open. You must be open for his leading. Openness says this. This is a sign of someone that's open. It will say this. I am sorry. You were right. A person that's open goes to others and says, I got something here I haven't quite figured out. Would you speak into my life? Are there things that I'm missing? There are issues that I don't know about. Would you speak into my heart? That's a person that is open. This is a person who will be met by a stranger and hear a word. And rather than have the dander just flare and all the feathers just get up and just say, oh, I'll show you who's right, will consider it, prayerfully bring it before Jesus Christ. Openness is the sign of a follower of Jesus Christ because he's steadfast 
in the finished work of Jesus. Not my pride, not my position, not my acceptance, not my identity, not in my fame, not in my popularity, but in who he is. Not stubborn, steadfast. Could it be that someone here right now needs that message? Because of your family, because of your past, because of your interpersonal relationships with your wife, with your kids? With somebody in your clique, maybe with a professor that rubs you wrong right now, could it possibly be that this is the time to bring it back to Jesus Christ and say, I am open, reveal, reveal to me, because I don't want to be a theologian that is an atheist. What I think guides what I do, and what I do determines the love that I will receive. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I, I look at this student body and I, without the crystal ball, just knowing your heart and the equipping that happens here, I see the potential to impact a generation for your name and for your kingdom. And I see within my life the potential just to sabotage that simply because my thoughts, my perspectives, my worldview have become so stubborn and so locked in that I don't even listen to your voice anymore. We right here just want to say we're open. We want to be open, reveal. We're not asking you to dissect us. We're just asking to reveal in your kind, Holy Spirit way, draw us to your heart. We open ourselves once again, anew and afresh, like days of old, and ask you to speak. But we don't want to be alienated from you and your love. Draw us close to you as we humble ourselves. Thank you for the promise that you will draw us back like a prodigal son, back to your heart. We rejoice in Jesus Christ and his work for us and our eternal destiny in him, in whose name we pray, amen.